We good to go, Michael? Good evening. We are we are now starting uh, into the second uh, second interview that we have for our course uh, for this year, which is the six years that we've uh, that we've run the White House Communications or some variant of it, like the White House Press Corps. And we are pleased to have Kevin Sullivan, who was the last director of the Office of Communications in the Bush White House and is um, now has his own company doing his own consulting work where he is combining sports and politics, a combination that uh, a lot of us love. And I could see that that must, must be fun. Is it more fun than, uh, than uh, working in a White House? You know, well, nothing's like working in the White House. And, and uh, uh, hey, everybody out there, appreciate you uh, being there tonight. Uh, and I'm also doing, doing some corporate work, but uh -huh. it's an opportunity for me to take everything that I've learned in my career in sports, going back to the Dallas Mavericks and NBC Sports days, corporate, uh, I worked in a corporate job at NBC Universal as well, and then of course the White House experience, which is like none other, you know, to wrap all those together and be able to take all those experiences and knowledge, hopefully, uh, and offer them to clients in a way that can help them develop their messaging and and plan their communication strategy is something that, that uh, I'm excited about and looking forward to. Yeah. Well, there certainly is no end of, of uh, crises in the sports world that there, you know, <laughs> and in the political world, too. Well, we've to had deal it, with. in the sports world, we've had two big ones with Michael Phelps and, and uh, Alex Rodriguez recently, and, and that you know, provides a lot of uh -huh. food for thought and things, uh, ways to do it and ways not to do it. So uh, it's been interesting. What, uh, what have you found that, that you learned from the White House that you hadn't known in the either or experienced in the sports world or the corporate world? You know, and back in December, I went out to the baseball winter meetings in Las Vegas, and I, I spoke to the PR directors there, and I told them three or four things I wish I knew when I was a team PR director that I learned at the, at the White House. And, you know, rapid response was a big part of that. Um, and uh, another one was always making sure that communications is represented at the beginning of a process. You know, the, if you're going to fire your manager or your coach, you know, the, the, the communications guy should be included in the, in the discussions at the earliest stage possible. Oftentimes in sports, those decisions are made out of emotion, you know, and you, you lose a big game and it's like, let's get rid of the guy, and you don't think of the proper way to do it. Uh -huh. and, uh, and so that was another one. And I, and I think, um, you know, just preparation. You know, if you're... If you're uh, for example, when I, when I was at, uh, at NBC, prior to the Athens Olympics, you know, there was a threat of terrorism was heavy on everyone's minds. This was you know, the summer of '04, And we had a plan in place for what would happen in the event of a, of a, a variety of levels of terrorist attack that, that either the attack was made against NBC or in, uh, involved NBC or was just NBC covering it at the Olympics. And we had an array of holding statements and a, a phone you know, tree you know, uh, set up to how we would handle communications of a terrorist attack at the Olympics. They were all approved by the lawyers. They were on the shelf, you know, in the drawer uh, when we departed New York for Athens. And so we felt totally prepared. Well, in baseball and in the corporate world, I don't think they often have a plan. You know, what if the team manager or the third baseman gets a DWI tonight at 2 in the morning? How do you handle it? Call the he says call the union representative. <laughs> you know, so so I tried to you know be, you know with two or three weeks left in my time at the White House, you know we all went to the one of the you know so-called undisclosed locations and did a drill on how we would handle communications if we had to evacuate the White House. So we were always you know trying to prepare yeah. for the kind of what if scenarios and uh, and I think that's another thing I learned there that I would impart back now to to clients in my in my comp my, my business or uh, you know as I. Kind of go around talking to people. Uh huh. What do you miss about the White House? You know, without question, it's just the people. I mean, the camaraderie was incredible. You have this group of people that, that you're in this. You know, it's a combination of being in a foxhole and being away at camp together. You know, you're going through this incredible uh, experience together, and uh, there's just nothing like it to bring people together. We actually had a had a breakfast yesterday, kind of the first monthly White House alumni. You know. Uh, breakfast. I think we'll do it sometimes as a lunch, and you know, it's sort of part uh, part breakfast, part therapy session. You know, mm -hmm. and it was just it was really great to see everybody. And you could tell the reaction on, on everybody how how nice it was to be you know kind of back together. Uh -huh. So that, that's it. The people. I mean, there's this incredible adrenaline rush every day. 
you know, I missed out a little bit, you know, not every day, but uh, uh -huh. the main thing is, and, you know, I tried to be mindful while I was there that, you know, you're part of history. You know, when I would walk through the, through the, uh, along the colonnade with the Rose Garden there, you could see the Washington Monument. As, I, as we got closer to the end, I started walking, you know, slower and slower to try to, you know, soak it all up and, and, and just, uh -huh. you know, savor it, uh, you know, before it was over. How does life change for you? When you when you leave, you know the number one thing you get a little more sleep. You get a lot more sleep, as a matter uh -huh. of fact. But I would have to say that the the biggest thing is that you have um, you begin to have some control of your schedule a little bit. You know, when you work at the White House, you know every single day you've got to be there 6:30, 6:45 to be ready for the 7:30 a.m. senior staff meeting. Right after the 7:30 senior staff meeting, there was an 8 o'clock communications meeting that Ed Gillespie ran. And then after that, I would pull my, my uh, deputies together for a real quick kind of huddle to make sure we were, had the right priorities and we were ready to go for the day. And so there was no kind of easing into the day. You know, you had to get there early, read the papers, know what was going on, and be prepared. And so, and then the, for many days, you know, much of the day was booked with meetings or other deadline kind of things. So the, the biggest difference lifestyle-wise has been to yeah. be just a little bit, you know, have a little modicum of control of, over your own of your own schedule, which has been nice. Uh huh. Did you find that in the White House that even the White House schedule was controlled by others? For example, the rhythms of the Congress. That uh, what Congress's Congress's schedule dictated um, a lot of what uh, what happened in the White House. No, absolutely. A lot of what you know, much of what happens at the White House, as you're seeing now with President Obama, is is inextricably linked to what's happening on the legislative calendar. And, and there is an ebb and flow to it, and it is a little bit different when they're on recess. And 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 uh, uh, and, and there are other outside forces, you know, besides the, the the legislative calendar, you know, just news of the day. You know, when I can remember um, uh, uh, the summer. This would have been the summer of '07, going to the to the neighborhood pool with my family, and I said, you know, I'm going to leave the BlackBerry in the car. And, and I came back after we were at the pool for a while. It was, you know, 8.30 or 9 o'clock at night, got back in the car, and I had a ton of messages. And I thought, oh, boy, something happened. And I looked, and sure enough, it was the Minneapolis bridge collapse. <laughs> and I knew at that moment that the rest of the week, there, were, yeah. you know, there was going to be right. presidential travel and there were going to be policy decisions. You know, we're going to be linked up with the Department of Transportation and other agencies and, and you know, FEMA. There's going to be a response to this. What's the president going to say? Does he go out? Does... Secretary Peters go out. I mean, you know, and those sort of things. When something like that happens, you know, you swing into action, and it really does, you know, fill up the, the yeah. your, you know, your, your priorities shift, and it fills up the calendar accordingly. Uh huh. So how how was that planned out? So once once you read your BlackBerry and you saw what had gone on, who do you have to link up with? Say within the White House, who gets together, and what kind of planning? Did you, did you well, have? you have you have a sort of the substantive planning on the policy front in terms uh -huh. of, you know, what's FEMA doing? How is the money being freed up? Has a disaster declaration, you know, been declared? All the policy kind of stuff would be really run out of the chief of staff's office, mm -hmm. and so we're linked into the communications people. We're linked into that, so you're kind of monitoring that and then basing the communications plan against that. So the night that it happened, it was all done via email. We may have had a conference call, but I, I think it was all. You know, by email. But then the next morning, the first thing we did at 7:30 in the morning was firm up that plan. You know, when could the president go? As it turns out, Mrs. Bush was there. You know, an unrelated business when it happened, and so that that played into it. You know, she went and made uh -huh. a statement, as I recall. Uh, but you know, we linked up with the Red Cross. We evaluated with the chief of staff's office when could the president travel there. He ended up going that Saturday, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then we talked about what kind of you know what does he do when he's there? Does he meet with the the mayor, the governor, does he go to a Red Cross station? You know, what does he do? So you just you, there's a there's a rhythm at the White House when there's news like that that you that you fall into quickly, and uh -huh. and you sort of instinctively know what needs to be done next. What offices would you have to deal with? Like? For example, would you deal with Ledge Affairs sure. because you're dealing with the uh, the congressman from Minnesota? Sure. From Minnesota? You, you you would deal with intergovernmental relations and dealing with right. how they deal with the mayor of St. Paul in that case in, in Minneapolis. And, uh, and the governor, of course, you would deal with the, with the legislative affairs in terms of the congressional delegation from, from from Minneapolis. But also, you know, is anything going to be needed, 
you know, are there disaster funds sufficient, you know, to, to uh, address it? Is there going to have to be any, you know, extra uh, appropriations asked for? Uh, you know, definitely uh, Homeland Security Council, which oversaw f the, our relationship with FEMA. So they, were, they kind of managed the disasters in the White House. So you may, it, that may not come to mind immediately when you think of Homeland Security Council, but because of the law enforcement component, they manage the wildfires and tornadoes and hurricanes and floods and all that stuff, uh -huh. um, along with intergovernmental. So there was that. And, and then, of course, the communications operation. Does anything need to be written? You know, all those kind of things. But it's, it's, it really does become second nature because this sort of thing happens almost every week, not, a, not a necessarily a, a disaster, but something that, out, that you have to respond to from outside of the walls of the uh -huh. you know, White House. What are some of the things that you could plan on for a year? the things that, that you knew that you were going to have that were opportunities? Well, you know the president's travel, especially the foreign travel. You know that there's going to be a NATO summit, and there's an APEC meeting, and you, you know that there's certain uh, annual or, or biannual world leader meetings that he's going to be participating in. So, there's, so that uh -huh. you kind of build in. Um, and, and there are other things that happen every year. You know, there's certain kinds of speeches he gives every year. You know, it might be a trip to the to the you know the American Legion or the VFW annual right. convention. You know, there's certain sort of you know you know big events on the schedule every year that you, that are annual, uh, and and you can kind of plan for those. Did uh, was there a time when you all would um, take time out and say okay you know like like say in in August when not much is going on and say let's look at the next year and see what kinds of things can be done. We did. We especially, you know, we overseas travel was always planned out a year in advance. Uh huh. Um, and you know, it's funny because we always thought that August, you know, was going to be quiet, um, and it never really seemed to work out that way. There was there was yeah. always something that happened, like a hurricane. You know, yeah. So so, um, there, but there were meetings that were longer term in, in terms uh -huh. of planning. Sure. When would when would they likely to be? They were really ongoing. I mean, we had a meeting. We called it strategery. Uh -huh. which was kind of our own, you know, uh, show of good sportsmanship, I guess. Uh, and we had a strategic meeting once a month, and that was a long-term, you know, uh -huh. planning meeting. So it, it was an ongoing, you know, we always tried to be, you know, four, six, eight weeks ahead on the, on the calendar. And, 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 again, the annual things, you know, we did meet about it and would, would build them in, uh, you know, kind of at the, at the outset of the year. Who would be involved in those? It would be, you know, like when Joe Hagan was there or Blake Gottesman after him, Particularly on coordinating the travel with the, you know, the Secret Service and the advance team, um, they would call those meetings, and then everybody would would participate from there. The, you know, the communications in the press office and and uh, any, you know, the policy shops that may be affected, depending on what it was. The NSC for everything that was that was foreign. Uh -huh. National Security Council. Uh, tonight is um, President Obama's first uh, speech to a joint session of Congress. And which reminds me of the State of the Union right. message. It's not a State of the Union uh, because that's not done in the first year. But you do lay out right. what you see ahead of you, even if you're not um, summing up what's happened in the past year. Uh, when did uh, State of the Union planning begin? November. It was uh -huh. it, usually it would be before the president would go to Camp David for Thanksgiving. He would he would have one session with the speechwriters and and. Uh, would you know we would get together and talk about themes you know very broadly and then often after remember the state of the union would be january you know it it varied on the on the calendar but it was right. you know around january you know yeah. 20th or whatever right. and so so thanksgiving is a good you know two months ahead of time uh which is a long time you know for a speech because you normally there's so much happening you can't get that far ahead but the state of the union is bigger and different than any than any other speech so there'd be an outline waiting for the president usually after Thanksgiving uh, when he came back, you know, kind of here's what we talked about. And you would quickly identify with the pol as part of the policy process, all right, the four big, you know, themes this year are going to be, you know, education, energy, health care, and, you know, something else, let's say, just hypothetically. And there would be a process that would be run on each of those four areas to make sure the policy is, is well formulated and there aren't a lot of loose ends and that it, that – that what the president, because the president can't just go say, you know, we're going to do health care reform. He's going to say, we're re I'm recommending, I'm calling for a standard tax deduction, much like the one you have for your mortgage, 
to be used for your health insurance, for example, so that the people who don't get it through work are not penalized. That was an example from 07. Well, so, so before the president can go say that, you have to make sure that all the policy traps have been run on that notion of doing a standard tax deduction. So there's a whole process that, that kind of goes in terms of the substance that goes while the writing is, is happening. Well, when, the, um, when you get together in, uh, in November, who, who gets together? The speech meetings were, were typically uh, the head of speech writing and a couple of his lieutenants, so usually about three speech writers. Uh, the counselor to the president, Dan Bartlett, or later Ed Gillespie, uh, me, and then the uh, staff secretary, Raul Giannis, was the one that, uh, at the end, because the staff secretary is responsible for the accuracy of all the documents that, that, that go to the president and all the words that he, that he says. So they run a staffing process to make sure everything is accurate. So it's important, the staff secretary really controls the flow of paper. So when a speech draft goes from number one to number three or number five, that's, that process is managed by the staff secretary, so, so he's involved from the, uh, from the beginning. So, so it's, you know, five or six, seven people. Oftentimes, uh, Joel Kaplan, who was the deputy chief of staff for uh -huh. policy, he'd be there, you know, in terms of the policy component. Josh Bolton uh, would be there, the chief of staff. Uh, so it was a small group, and then as it progressed along, uh, it might widen out a little bit. Steve Hadley, the national security advisor, uh, was involved, of course. Uh, when the pre president started rehearsing, Dana Perino uh, was a part of the, the, the process as well, I should say. You know, so, and there'd be rehearsals. In the State of the Union, you, know, you would get up to um, you know, 30, 40 drafts. And, and a draft can be, you know, a comma can change. So it th doesn't necessarily mean 30 or 40 or 50 you know, major overhauls. But, mm -hmm. but it's a fascinating process. And, then, and there, there's, there's read-throughs, and then there's sort of edit sessions. And then the president would get to a point where he was ready to, to actually run through it a week or 10 days before the State of the Union. And we would go to the family theater in the White House, and uh, it would be set up just like it would be as close as we could approximate. Although the speaking in the House is the greatest, you know, uh, the president used to say the, the greatest speech venue of them all because the, you know, the atmosphere is electric and the people are really literally, uh, you know, kind of hanging down on top of you and it's pretty exciting you know, adrenaline rush kind of a, a venue. And so you can't com exactly uh -huh. approximate it, but we could approximate, you know, the, how the teleprompter looks, because that was one speech. Uh, he, used a t he doesn't use a teleprompter. President Bush didn't use a teleprompter all the time, like you're seeing President Obama, yeah. who uses it virtually in every speech uh -huh. he gives from a little East Room event. I was surprised to see it on the factory floor at the Caterpillar plant uh -huh. uh, uh, last week or the week before in, in, uh, in, in Peoria. But anyway, uh -huh. that's kind of how the State of the Union goes. Uh -huh. um, I went through a lot of uh, Reagan speeches at the Reagan Library, and one of the things that uh, I noticed that is on a speech, like a State of the Union speech, there would be, um, there would be initials by each of the facts that were in right. that speech so that somebody signed off on the accuracy of everything that was in that speech. Did you all have that process? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 uh, that's the staff secretary office runs that. They're, they have a whole, you know, department of fact checkers and researchers, and, uh, and every fact is, uh, is checked and, you know, uh, double checked and, and verified. Uh-huh. So, uh, uh, anyway, do you, you know that's going to be something. Those speeches, I think there'll be some issue, of course, going back to the 2003. Uh, well, yeah, and that's, there's already and been a lot. signed of, off on the accuracy. Yes, and, you know, yeah. Steve Hadley, who was the Deputy right. National Security Advisor at the time, stepped forward and right. took responsibility for that. And, and if I'm not mistaken, offered to resign, which the president right. refused. And, and yeah. uh, you know, so he did take responsibility for that. It was, you know, the intelligence community is made up of, you know, 18 or 20 agencies. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, there was a process that it went through and it was signed off on by by the intelligence community writ large. Yeah, so it was right. an unfortunate mistake, as it turns out. But, you know, yeah. I, uh, you know it, was, yeah, it, was, it was a mistake. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, can, you, um, can you break it down, because you, you are breaking it down there, as to the various parts of, uh, that you would go through? So the beginning, you get everybody together to talk about themes. And then, um, then do you uh, involve the policy people kind of one by one? Like, would you bring Hadley in uh, to talk about uh, whatever there is on national security? 
um, or in foreign policy right. and then uh, right. uh, Wayne State. Exactly. And, and let me back up one step, like on the, on the themes. Like I remember in, uh, I think it was in 08, one of the themes was empowerment. And so the president had this notion of, you know, you know, we're, you know, trusting the American people to keep more of their tax dollars. And then it was that, and that theme was sort of executed throughout. So there was a, a sort of a framework to that theme that, that was almost separate from the policy. So they kind of ran on, on, on parallel tracks. We've got this theme. Here's the policy. How can we match up the, the two? Uh -huh. And it's not that you would cook up some policy to match the theme, but it, the theme happened to fit, you know, was the sort of thing that would flow into the policy. So you have, you have the writers working on it, and then the policy process is going on at the same time, and then the two come together is really kind of how it works. Uh -huh. And Hadley would really be involved from the outset. I mean, because anything that involves anything you know, overseas or you know, foreign policy or national security would be in his you know, domain. And, and, uh, and you know, uh, uh, he, so he was there from the, you know, from the earliest meetings. How do you find a time when you can... Um, all of you can kind of separate yourselves out from all of the the, uh, the things that are just continually coming at you during a right. day because doing that kind of work requires a different kind of thinking right and so how do you do that it's one of the most difficult things Martha it's a great question you know there's really no time to think during the day right. and you know you're kind of operating on a, on a depleted you know on a, you know energy level uh, it's tough you know to get enough sleep to always be fresh and sharp and everything and I really think that uh, there's one of two things happens you either literally you know close the door and 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 focus you know and just everything else has to stop or you do it on the weekend or you do it at home yeah. at night and one of the things that it's tough to do it at home at night because you're tired but one of the things that I would do I would get home around eight o'clock at night and I'd have like an hour with kind of with the family and I'd eat something and you know relax a little bit and often from nine to ten I would kind of read the stuff for the next day I used to call it second shift, you know, and, and it was really sort of my time to make sure that I was prepared for the next day because there's no worse feeling than walking in the door there knowing that you really don't have a handle on what you're going to be dealing with. The stakes are high, you know, it's, if you make a mistake out of, out of carelessness, it can really be bad. So, so I would do it that way as it would be, you know, the weekend. I, I got up, you know, early during the week, obviously, to get there, and I tried to get up just as early on the weekend, maybe half an hour later, so that I would use that time, that quiet time before the, my family was, you know, up and about on Saturday and Sunday morning to, to do that kind of thinking and reading. It, but it is a challenge because uh, it's tough to do it during the week. The phone is ringing. The emails are pouring in. There are outside pressures and deadlines. Um, yeah. You know, now, when the president calls a meeting and, like, you know, he'll set the schedule for the State of the Union, you know, the series of meetings, the good thing is, like, when he calls the meeting, you know, everything else becomes, you know, right. secondary. So, so that that worked fine that way. But uh, was that but, a weekend? Uh, there were some weekend meetings, but mostly it was during the week. Uh huh. Um, but as we got like the weekend before the State of the Union, we always worked, and it's sometimes the, you know two weekends before. Uh huh. Uh, well, let's say right before Thanksgiving, you're you're uh, thinking, you're picking out your themes, and you've got all the people there, and you would have. Um, Domestic policy would also be there, right? right. Um, so, and that that pre that pre Thanksgiving uh, meeting or, or conversation is usually very informal, and it may be as, as simple as the president calling in the speechwriters just just for a, a conversation for a few minutes, saying, "Here's what I'm thinking about for this year." Come back with some thoughts and some research and some history and an outline, and then after Thanksgiving is when it would become more formal, and the speechwriters would then you know, kind of take what the president told them more informally, and the process would, would start going. But uh -huh. the, the, the State of the Union process is really run by the counselor to the president and the staff secretary. Uh-huh. Um, is the, the budget director involved? No. Uh -huh. Now, the budget director would be involved in those underlying policy meetings that are happening, in the, in the, to use the health care example, if we call for a standard tax deduction, for your health insurance, what does that mean for the budget? They'd be involved there, but they're not in the meetings, you know, when you're doing edit sessions and going over the language and uh -huh. that sort of thing. So how does it develop? We, uh, we don't, we don't, you know, we don't leave, we month. don't let, we don't let the budget guys anywhere near the, 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 <laughs> the rhetoric part. So, just kidding. 
<laughs> Actually, I'm not kidding. No. <laughs> uh, so, what would you uh, what would you do next? What would be the next set of meetings? You've had the president meet uh, with uh, with the speechwriters and and I guess probably with the policy people too. Yeah, that that comes later. Okay. As that so as that policy process is going on a parallel track, it would culminate with what's called policy time, which is where the which is where the final staff recommendation from his senior advisors is put before the president. And it would be it would be like this. It would be okay if we did a tax credit, it, here's how it would work. Here would be the impact on the budget. Here's how here's what people would save or how much it would cost and all the varying, you know, uh -huh. stakeholder issues associated with it. And here's how it would be for a standard deduction. And the president would make a decision. I'm going there are benefits to this, but I'm going standard deduction. And the and the whole, you know, not just the, all the policy uh, offices, but Ledge Affairs and the budget people and really everybody involved with the the domestic policy would weigh in on that. And there'd be representation from, you know, Health and Human Services, you know, Secretary Levitt would have been involved at that point, you know, that sort of thing. So Yeah. So uh what you know. point is that? When it what kind of time? When what month? Would that be late December or uh January? You know, it's probably yeah, it would no it would be it would be a this that would be a December kind uh -huh. of a kind of a deal, right. Uh huh. So you'd know pretty much what um by the by Christmas time. Right. And sometimes it would have been something that you knew, like there may have been a policy process on that topic going on the previous summer, and so it just was updated. It, it's not like you start from scratch because we have a speech coming up, you uh -huh. know. But, uh, but, but, but the State of the Union can drive policy. There's no question about it. Yeah. Um, what do you see when you're thinking about the State of the Union and talking to the President about it? What did the what did the president see as different about that speech than any other speech? Well, you know, it's 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 uh, when you think of presidential speeches, you think of inauguration, you know, inaugural addresses, and state state of the union addresses. You know, more than more than any other uh, speech the president will deliver, it is remembered. It more people listen and watch. Uh, you can download it on iTunes. You know, I mean, it is out there for everybody for yeah. forever. And so there's no question that the president is aware of the magnitude of the moment and, and how important it is and the lasting impact that those words are going to have. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, so in, in the venue itself, as I mentioned a minute ago, he, he you know, I was there for, uh, um, for two State of the Union addresses, and he commented both times on just how amazing the, you know the venue was as a as a you know as a place to give a speech and the adrenaline rush and the electric atmosphere and uh -huh. and all that. So I think you remember that too. Kind of what what um, did he talk about it about um, uh, what is the atmosphere? What are the acoustics in uh, in the room? So the are the acoustics are they good? Um, yeah, I think I think they're good. I think you know I think the thing you come away with though is the proximity of the people. You know, you had that narrow kind of shoot there, where the, the uh -huh. you know the the gallery is kind of right behind you, and 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 uh, and the lights are bright, and uh, there's a buzz to it. There's no question about it. It's a special night. You've got the the Joint Chiefs sitting in the front row. You've got the you've got the justices of the Supreme Court sitting there in their robes. I mean, it is. You have the cabinet all kind of lined up, and you know, it's an amazing thing in our government. I mean, it is a night where everybody really is in the same place. To, to hear the president talk about his priorities for the upcoming year and also to set the tone. You know, it's not really, um, it, it's funny, there were some people who, who, who commented on, uh, in the press in the days after President Obama's inaugural address, commenting on how much policy was in it. Because normally, the policy is reserved for the State of the Union. It is really mm -hmm. designed to, for the president to articulate his priorities and to set his agenda, and that takes the form uh, of policy. And, and, and so you're aware that it is, it's this magnificent, great thing in our, for our country, but it's also kind of a substantive, you know, newsy, uh, policy-heavy speech, unlike other speeches which are more, um, you know, designed to be more uplifting and to set a tone and not necessarily be as heavy on facts and figures and dollars and, and those kind mm -hmm. of things. How do you keep it rolling? Both the uh, the energy that the president gets from it, and the all of the ideas that he's discussed. You what know, were, the so ways much that you all did it. So much goes into um, 
But by the time we get to the night of the State of the Union, everybody on the team pretty much could deliver the speech almost from memory. I mean, you've read it so many times, you've heard it so many times, and you, the president has rehearsed it a number of times. And so, you, you're, if there is a if there's a lull or if there is a chink or a you know a a, a something that's not quite right, you wouldn't have identified it by then and kicked it out. You know, so I think it it normally rolls pretty good. Yeah. Uh, well, I, now I was thinking of. Um, uh, in a sense, how do you, after he's given the speech? Oh, I see what you mean. I'm, I'm then, sorry. Yeah. Then, okay. Then what we would what we would do there is you would design, usually four days of travel right out of the box that you would have, uh, for let's say it was typically there'd be in our case there were four policy, uh, uh, new policy things that were going to be addressed, um, and and so you would plan, you know, health care the day after the State of the Union we're going to Kansas City to do health care. And then we're going to Delaware to do energy. And then we're going to Los Angeles to do trade. And then we're going to, you know, somewhere else to do something else. And, and so you, you, you plotted it out that way to try to, you know, so you have your big national stage. Then you have get regional coverage around the country for, the, for each of the events that you have there. And, of course, there's documents and there's stuff on the website. And there's the cabinet members are also on, an, on, a, on a parallel track. They're out doing events as well you know, on those, on their areas. And then there are some things that don't make the cut for the State of the Union that you kind of do after, after that. But the immediate week of the State of the Union, uh, and one thing I'll always remember is we were, we were in Kansas City doing health care after the State of the Union in, in 07, I think it was. And, um, and the president got back on Air Force One and asked me, you know, he said, how's it playing out there? And meaning, you know, our, yeah. our health care message. And I said to him, well, you know what's playing today, Mr. President? The DNA came back on Anna Nicole's baby. And that's what's <laughs> playing today. And, and it was one of those lessons that, you know, no matter how well you planned and how well you prepared and everything, the event could have been the greatest thing from a cable news standpoint in particular. It was everything it came to a screeching halt that day. And it was all about Anna Nicole, you know. And the DNA coming back, and so you know that's just the, you got to roll with it because that's the reality of uh, the news cycle these days. Yeah, well, I remember when uh, when she when she died, and uh, the press room had, was over at Jackson Place because the uh, the White House press room was being uh, renovated, and uh, so when the announcement came of her death, I remember Mark Smith coming out of his booth, his radio booth, his AP radio booth and said, well, everybody can go home. There's going to be no news from the White House today. Right. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you another one like that that the, that the students may be interested in, uh, especially a couple of days after the Oscars. Uh, in um, last uh, fall, I guess it was, or uh, when Heath Ledger passed away, that day we actually, it was, I'll tell you what, it was right before the Super Bowl because the, the, uh, the uh, office, the drug czar, the Office of National Drug Control Policy was, uh, was unveiling their new commercials. They were going to run a new commercial in the Super Bowl. Remember, it was the Super Bowl where they, did the, they debuted the commercial, this is your, the egg and the frying in the pan, this is your brain, you know, on drugs. Right. Yeah. So there was a little bit of a history with the, with the drug czar and the Super Bowl. And they, but they hadn't done an ad in the Super Bowl in a number of years, and they were coming back with... with um, with a new ad, and, and there, was a, there was a new effective, pretty effective campaign, as it turned out, two or three different spots aimed at prescription drugs, which was a new, a new thing. Uh, teen drug use was down, but prescription drug use among teenagers was up, and so this was kind of a campaign that was about that and directed in part at, at parents. Well, we, did, we went to the president and said, you know, we think you ought to do a screening with the drug czar, John Walters, for the White House press corps of these new commercials, a couple of days before the Super Bowl. The president agreed to do it. I think we were going to do it like the Wednesday or Thursday before, and that day Heath Ledger was found dead. And so we thought, and it was prescription drugs, and we thought, you know, the last thing we wanted to do was look like we were commenting on the untimely and tragic death of Heath Ledger because that was completely, you know, unrelated. Yeah. Uh, and so we called it off. Uh -huh. You know, we didn't do it. And, uh, and I think it would have been, uh, you know, again, it was a, the president's last year in office, or actually it was, he, he, had, he had a year to go at that point, January of, of 08. But we were looking for different kind of things like that for him to do, and I think it would have been a compelling, it would have called a lot of attention to the, to the fact that, you know, uh, the campaign was shifting to prescription drug abuse by teenagers, and yet because of those outside forces like you asked about earlier, 
we had to shift our, our plan. And uh -huh. that kind of thing happened all the time. One of the things that seemed to happen in, uh, in your last year was that, the, uh, that both, uh, both parties had exceptionally interesting uh, races right. uh, for the presidential nomination. And uh, I know down in the basement of the press room, there were days when I would come in and turn the lights on because nobody was there. I mean, you would have CNN and Fox in their booth, but there were no print people there. And there were a lot of booths that were just empty right. because news organizations just weren't covering the White House anymore. Right. What impact did that have in you all? You know, we, we, didn't, we totally understood that this was the most compelling political season of, of a generation, you know, and so it wasn't like there were people didn't understand why it was happening. Yeah. You also had, you know, bureaus shrinking in size, and so there were fewer reporters. Right. So exactly. if, if a bureau went from three to two or two to one, that one person was going to be on the, on the campaign trail or might be with one reporter with each candidate uh, at that point. So, it, it, you know, how it affected us, you know, I think, um, I, don't think I don't think it affected us um, it affected the things that weren't really uh, hot, hard news. Uh -huh. You know, I think things like uh, an example, kind of like the Heath Ledger thing, when we did events that were, not the Heath Ledger thing, but the, what would have been right. a drug announcement. Yeah. When we did the events that were a little softer in message that normally the White House press corps would have covered, there was probably, we probably did a little bit less of that in an acknowledgement that we weren't going to be able to break through. But when we had news, we did still break through. And, but, but the point, I think, that I'd like to make the... The, the triple whammy of the economic uh, meltdown starting really in September with the, right. with the Fannie and Freddie thing in early September, coupled with the campaign, um, really made the, really changed the final few months of the, of the, from a communication standpoint, um, in terms of any, you know, uh, legacy kind of things that we would do. There was so much hard news happening you know, with the president down to the wire. Then you had violence in the Middle East kind of at the end as well. Yeah, there was so much happening that was, that was newsy and substantive and important and compelling that uh, the notion that we were going to be doing a lot of, you know, we still did a, quite a bit in terms of speeches and presidential interviews, but the president had to be the one doing it. There wasn't much of an appetite on the, the TV networks and the cable news networks to talk to third parties about the president's record or you know, to go out and pitch surrogates, you know, get the Karen Hughes's and the Ari Fleischer's and the Andy Cards out there. You know, they did some, but there wasn't a great demand for it because there was so much news happening, you know, that had to do with the president. It really didn't, it seemed kind of tone deaf to be reminiscing or, or looking, looking way back. Uh-huh. Um, what, um, what do you see that's going on now in the preparation, say for uh, President Obama? in, in uh, his communications and the way that they're preparing for the State of the Union or the way they're also uh, handling their communications all together. What do you, what do you see that you find um, uh, interesting, uh, you know, may, maybe things that are, that are different, things that are effective, things that are not so effective? Okay, a couple things. First of all, um, in the transition, I, got the, I had the opportunity to spend some time with Ellen Moran, who was my successor, yeah. and Dan Pfeiffer, her deputy, and they're both really smart and talented. And, and I'm not saying that like to suck up or whatever, but I think they're really capable, and, uh, and I enjoyed working with them during the transition. And I think Robert Gibbs is a, is a uh -huh. talented guy. They're, these are smart people who, are, uh, who, are, who are, are doing fine. The thing I would say is it takes a while to figure it out. It's different than the campaign trail. You know, I'm not a veteran of, of, of campaigns, but I, I do know that campaigning is different from governing. And I think they've seen that. Uh, and uh, just a couple of observations. I mentioned one with the teleprompter. Okay. President Obama is probably the most gifted communicator of our generation. And I don't think he needs, my hunch would be he doesn't need a teleprompter. And I think when you go to a factory floor where they make heavy equipment in Peoria, Illinois, blue collar place, guys with their sleeves rolled up, literally, on a, on, a, on a floor, and you see that wide shot on TV, and you see that he's got the teleprompter set up. I just think it, 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 there's a disconnect there. It's, it looks overly staged. I mean, everything that the president does is going to be staged anyway. It, so that surprised me, you know, that, that this is, he's such a, a compelling, you know, yeah. public speaker. I don't get that. You know, that would be one, if, mm -hmm. if, that one question I would like to ask. The, the Obama team, and I don't mean it as a criticism, it's an observation and a question. Why do you think you need to do that? 
Um, you know, there were there have been images from the East Room from events where you see the plates and the president is on the stage with the vice president. You can't see the vice president's face because the teleprompter plate is obscuring him. Yeah. So I think that they're going to figure that stuff out. You know, it, 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 it's right. it's that that has been a little unusual right. to me. And it's also the whole tableau in the East Room. You know, a lot of the the East Room is how it all looks. It's the, right. it's the aura of the presidency that right. is involved in that room, whether it's the John Singer Sargent portrait of Theodore Roosevelt or the Gilbert Stewart of, right. uh, of Washington. And they've also chosen to use the south side of the room. Right. And, and so they cut off all the light from that right. end. So that means there's the only light in the room is from the north side. Right. And so the room is very, uh, very dark. It looks different, yeah. but that you know they'll, they'll figure all that out, and they yeah. may decide that's the best way to do it. And that, you know, that that's that's their call, obviously. Other another thing, the um, when the when Chief Justice Roberts had to come over to redo the oath, uh, I was stunned to learn uh, that they didn't bring the pool in. Now they brought in some wire photographers, right? Yeah. Um, but no reporters. Am I, am, I think they might have had. Uh, they have a wire reporter. I think there, they might have had had one, but um, they had to print. But you didn't have pictures. He had no pictures. And the thing that struck me unusual about that is, first of all, it was Ch Chief Justice Roberts's fault. He was the one that bungled the oath. So it wasn't like what happened was a bad reflection on the president. Secondly, you know, this is the, the president of the United States and the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court at the White House doing something official. <laughs> as called for in our Constitution, you know, that was a pretty big deal. And to, and to not bring the pool in, especially when you've said on the campaign trail that you're going to be the most transparent administration of all time, really to me was sort of tone deaf and a missed opportunity. And the press pounced on it, and I think, mm -hmm. it, you know, and I think they would have liked to have had that decision over again. But to release a White House photo, you know, because I think, I guess the photographers to, out of protest didn't use the photos or whatever. I, I don't remember what... But they, but there was a White House photo that was issued, that was odd, an odd call to me. But they'll figure, they'll figure that out too. I think the, um, the press conference when, when he, they notified the reporters in advance that they were going to be called on, I didn't understand the thinking behind that. I don't think they, that they did notify them that okay. they would be called on. I think that was a. Uh, was that a that was I a think myth? That was a, I think that was a. I think it's going to become an urban legend. Okay, because I've heard uh, that from a number of people. Yeah. And it didn't. Because Kurtz had it in his in his okay, uh, well, article, I, right. and I don't know if he ever corrected it, but um, they did that on the campaign trail, um, but they didn't do it. Uh, they they didn't do it, but they had uh, they had a list. You know, they had a list that they worked on what, from, right. which was a long list. Right. Um, and then he chose how he wanted to uh, to move in right. the room. But one of the things that you notice is that he called on almost the very same people that Bush would have called on. Well, the one thing I didn't know, he called on Sam Stein from Huffington Post, yes, which, that was which, which we would not have done. And, I, you know, and that was a good thing to do, and I give him credit. One other, just one other little thing, and, and they'll figure this out too, and they may disagree with me. I'm a guy, I'm just like a civilian now, so I, I'm kind of popping off. But you know, when the president was up there, when he was calling on the reporters, he was kind of looking at a list, and he, was, he would say, you know, Jim Axelrod, CBS News. And, and to me, it struck me as non-presidential. You know, the pres he, he, ought to, he, he can say Jim Axelrod, you know, mm -hmm. or Jim or whatever. But to, to kind of read his, his affiliation and everything sounded to me like something that the press secretary would do or, you know, not, not necessarily the president. And that was just, again, just something that struck me as a little, well, I don't think it was that big of a deal. But he, he noticed them. This is, again, a guy who's very smooth. Looking down the list and then kind of trying to find where they were, you know. Uh -huh. I, I bet you, I bet you that the next press conference, there's a little bit of a different, um, you know, um, way that they that they do that because he, he was fumbling around a little bit and and again I don't think it, 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 you know he looked quite uh -huh. as as uh, as smooth as he normally does. He's an incredibly gifted guy on his feet and I think he'd be fine, to, you know, to kind of work off of a seating chart. The president always has a seating chart, and you know who's who's working. And it's trickier, uh, maybe in the East Room, because it was such a big crowd, and you had, you know, I know they they had radio talk show hosts and stuff. There were some people that wouldn't be at a typical, yeah. you know, White House press conference. But but anyway, what uh -huh. you know, that's just just a few observations. But, uh, uh, you know, I I know that the um, another interesting thing, and this is the reality of again is life of life in the White House. They made the decision to do. Um, uh, a series of interviews, 10-minute interviews with all the TV and cable networks. 
And the idea there was for the president to sell the stimulus. And it was a smart thing to do. But then in between the time they notified the, the TVs that they were going to have this round of interviews and the actual time of the interviews, the, the Senator Daschle thing blew up as the nominee, and he spent the whole time, you know, dealing with that. And I don't know, you know, we would always try to notify the networks as late as possible, you know, because there may be these external things that always happen. Sometimes yeah. you want to change the timing of something so that you can stay on message better. I'm not saying that's what happened in that case. I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah. But, but that was an interesting thing to me. One last thing, just as another observation, is a difference from past presidents, not just President Bush. On the Sunday of the Super Bowl, on Super Bowl Sunday, uh, President Obama did an interview with Matt Lauer in the Oval Office, and he wore open collar. And now, I don't think if you, if, you're, if you have the choice between being a great president and wearing a tie, you should be a great president. I'm not saying it's one or the other, but it surprised me. And I think it was totally appropriate not to wear a tie on Super Bowl Sunday to do an interview about a lot of different things, including the Super Bowl. But I, would, I was surprised they did it in the Oval Office with, in, informally dressed because that is the, you know, that is the, uh, it's, you know, uh, a, one of the most important rooms in our, in our democracy. And it's, by definition, it's a formal place. And there's lots of places in the White House you could have done it with an open collar and it would have been appropriate. I just thought it was an odd, and also, Oval Office interviews would typically be reserved for something really, really big and, and substantive. And this was, a, this was a more casual interview. And casual in the Oval Office aren't normally in the same sentence. So yeah. uh, that surprised me a little bit. Yeah. So one of the things that uh, President Bush uh, did in his, uh, in his communications and his addresses to the nation, for example, is that he did not do a lot of Oval Office addresses. Right. That he did a lot because the, um, the opportunities to do it elsewhere because of the, uh, the changes with the fiber optic cables that right. you could do it in a very short period right. of time in many different locations. And, and I can tell you, I'm sorry, I can tell you why. The, the, one of the reasons why, in uh, May of 06, uh, the president uh, wanted to begin talking about what he thought was the best way to handle uh, comprehensive immigration reform. And the decision was made to make it an Oval Office address. And because there had not been a lot of Oval Office ad addresses, it was a people really sat up and took notice. Mm -hmm. This is an address from the Oval Office about immigration reform. You know, wow, you know, what, you know, what's uh -huh. he going to say? This must really be big. Now, also, you, it's going to be short because you're asking the networks for time. You know, so it's going to be kind of a 12 or an 18-minute, probably the longest kind of a s speech, maybe even less than 10 minutes in some cases. But I think the, typically the Oval Office, uh, the President Bush, anyway, wanted to reserve it for, for those special moments that really would send a message that this is important. And, and, uh, and he did it, you know, 9-11, I believe, was the first one, and then there were, yeah. there, there were some others. But uh, he, he, reserved, he held that, you know, the Oval Office, as it was, uh, it was rare that we did th things in there. Uh -huh. and, the, and the Cabinet Room as well. We only use the Cabinet Room for certain kinds of uh, special interviews and, and things. He seemed to... Um, uh to do particularly well and like the environment of, say, Cross Hall, where he could right. come walk to the podium and, and be standing up. Right. I'll and tell you uh, that, the, that the, the Cross Hall is kind of the indoor version of the Rose Garden. Mm -hmm. It's good. Foreign leaders like it. It's a classic, uh, you know, kind of look down the hall. Um, and it, it does send a message when you, when you turn on, you know, the, the, the TV and you see the president walking up that carpet. Now, in the farewell address, we had him come in from the, from the, from the, the uh, I guess it would be the green room. Mm -hmm. so, so it was just a yeah. short walk in, so it wasn't kind of this long walk down the, the mm -hmm. blue room. No, blue. blue is in the center. Yeah, no, the green, green room, which is, is closest is, to the east room. Right. So, yeah. so, yeah, there's different yeah. ways to make that walk look, right. but, but yeah. Yeah, that, that's a great, that's a very formal, yeah. very presidential looking, uh, you know, kind of a venue. And, and, and you know, one thing is, I, I, you know, I was being critical or questioning or, you know, my observations on the Obama team. You know, I think what they've done and what they will do with new media will, you know, will, will set a new standard. They're going to put the resources behind it. They're really good at it. Um, there's a limit to what you can do out of the White House, I think, in terms of, of uh, you know, uploading to YouTube, that, you know, there's, for security reasons. They'll do that from outside the White House like we did. But, but uh, they will do, on the communications front, they will do more things right than they will do them wrong. 
And I think some of the some of the little things I've noticed that struck me as a little odd, uh, they will they will make an evaluation. They've been there for for a month, you know, and they'll kind of uh -huh. see how things work and don't work, and they'll they'll figure it out, you know, to their uh, to their best uh -huh. advantage. But one of the things about governing that one finds is. Uh, well, number one, I think from a campaign, most everybody's surprised when they come off a campaign because they have very high tech operations and they come right. into the White House and they're shocked. Right. Well, they had 85 people yeah. dedicated to new media on the campaign, and they had, you know, Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google, was was really kind of part of the team, and, and they really helped, you know, build the infrastructure of their web operation, and it was the greatest, you know, online. It was the greatest, uh, you know, communications innovation in the history of campaigning, you know, what they did online, and, and uh, they're to be, you know, commended for that. One other thing about the difference between campaigning and, and, and governing that I think is kind of interesting is on the campaign trail, the President Obama said, <clears throat> we're not going to have any lobbyists. And, and governing, you know, you kind of get in and you see in Washington, there are a lot of people who were part of the Clinton administration, let's say, and when they left, they wanted to go earn some money, and they went and they lobbied for a period of time, maybe the whole time since then. But they may be the most talented and the best people for a certain job. In fact, Secretary Gates, the holdover from the, from the Bush administration at the, at, as Secretary of Defense, really wanted this guy, William Lynn, from Raytheon, to be his Deputy Secretary of Defense for, for Operations, which includes pro procurement. And, and the secretary went to the president and said, this is my guy, this is the guy I've got to have. He interviewed a few other people. And so they made an exception. And then, of course, the president was sort of criticized. He ended up, I think, with 21 lobbyists, which is kind of a lot. I don't know. But a lot of them didn't lobby in the last two years, which is kind of what the promise was. But my point being, something that sounds good in Iowa a year before your president, in practice, you know, isn't necessarily the best thing when it comes to, to governing because this guy from Raytheon may in fact be the best guy for the job mm -hmm. you know we'll see and I think there were a number of things like that you know um, uh, at the outset of the stimulus the the the, the president said uh, we're going to act like citizens not partisans and then his leadership in Congress proceeded to completely derail that promise that the president made so there's an element here of, of hill management too that comes with being president, that's really tough to do. Uh -huh. You know, but they, you know, it, it, he wanted it to be, he really, what a, a party line vote on the stimulus package is not what the president had in mind. He really does want to change the tone. President Obama, I'm talking about, yeah, he really does want to change the tone, I believe, and, and set out to do that. And yet, once it got to Speaker Pelosi and Majority Leader Reid and the, the leadership on Congress, it became a food fight with House Republicans, and they were kind of off to the races, and it never really got you know, undone. And what we ended up with was a, was a huge victory for President Obama, you know, on the, on the stimulus. But it, it was a missed opportunity, I believe, in terms of the message that he wanted to send that things are going to be different in Washington with me, you know, at the helm. Yeah. Well, it's hard to. Uh, so, yeah, it is. And Different so when ways. you hear things on the campaign trail, sometimes, it, you know, it's, it doesn't yeah. work. In, in right. It, the one that um, has haunted um, Several Democrats has uh, promises to cut the White House staff by 25 percent. That was Kennedy, Carter, and Clinton, and then they had to uh, make good on it. Right. And they found that it was. Uh, it's pretty lean it to very, begin with. That's right. right. It's very difficult. Uh, very difficult to do that. Well, let's go to some questions, and we'll go first to Towson, and then uh, then you all get uh, get an opportunity. Uh, Towson. Um, can you just discuss with us some of the challenges in working with a press that was largely hostile towards your administration and what some of the solutions you found for that? You know, the, the question of media bias is, is always a good one, you know, and I know Dana Perino got this a lot kind of at the end of, of, of our time at the White House. I think the, um, the, the White House press corps did a, did a, uh, worked very hard, I think, to be fair and, and Mm -hmm. Our issues in terms of unfair coverage really were not with, for the most part, the reporters that were in the part of the White House press corps. I think the thing that has happened is that commentary has crept into uh, news reporting. And, and, and I think the tone of, of the commentary has become a little, little nastier than it used to be, let's say. But uh, not all, there's, there's, there's only a certain amount you can do about it. My, my view, Martha and I have talked about this a lot, 
if something, you know, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but they're not entitled to their own facts. So if something was, if something was false, inaccurate, misleading, you know, really blatantly unfair, we would jump on it and try to set the record straight. Sometimes effectively, sometimes not as much. Uh, and I think that's the best way you can respond to it. I don't think you should ever take it personally. Uh, I'm not a big believer as a communications practitioner and hanging up on people and never talking to them again. You know, we, we you know, had this, these kind of discussions at times. You know, we're never doing that again. We're never talking to that reporter again. And uh, I, I, never, I was not a big proponent of that because I think when you cut off the lines of communication, now you have no chance of making your point. Now, there's certain people that are of no, that would do us no good to talk to. Frank Rich, who's a columnist with the New York Times, comes to mind. There'd be nothing to be gained. He's not gonna, you know, you're not going to move him on anything. It's straight commentary. You know, bash the president for eight years. Um, and, you know, so you just accept it and you move on and you try to find other places to tell your story. So who would you, um, uh, who would you deal with if you, didn't, um, if you didn't like what they had to say? Well, you know, there were times that, that you know, you know I, the New York Times, for example, there were times that th there were reporters that th did stories that we, we thought were unfair and we did set in the record straights and put out documents, but I would always still talk to the reporters. And, and I think there were times when, you know, uh, my colleagues thought I was wasting my time. You know, it's, it'll do you no good kind of thing. And, uh, and yet I felt like it was always, it was, there was, if there was always a chance, uh, you know, to keep a relationship going and there was always a chance to make a point. And, and I, I often found that you may not change the story, but sometimes you can take off a couple of the rough edges and then, it, then it's worth maintaining that relationship. Uh -huh. Or you can and, and affect another story that's coming. That's right. That's coming down the pipe. And also, you know, uh, you know, I think we're also, you know, the body language and the tone and the defensiveness, all those kind of things reflect on the president. And, and you get, you know, the reporters will start to write that, you know, they're in a bunker mentality. You know, they're in lockdown mode. They've shut down. They're, they're defensive. They're on the run, you know. You know, so when you do those kind of things, there can be a cost, you know, I think at times, you know, uh, and not just to the president, but wherever you work for your, for your, you know, your congressman or your CEO or, or whoever, how you conduct yourself as a communications person with the reporters does reflect on your boss. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you all have a question? How, how did you manage your news flow? Uh, sorry. How did you manage your news flow? Like, what what would you check? What was at the top of your pyramid, like the Times or the Wires? And then, how did you find time to read it? It was a uh, it was a uh, early morning kind of deal. You know, uh, I'd get up about five or five fifteen, and we would already have clips coming in. And so, literally, you know, I'd be brushing my teeth, kind of looking at my BlackBerry, kind of seeing what what's there. Um, and then when I got in, you know, I'd go through the, uh, we had a clip summary that we would get at 7.30 in the morning. But before then, I would have read uh, the front page. This might strike you as funny. I would read the front, page, front section of the Washington Post and then the style section of the Washington Post. And then and I would save the metro section, the sports section to later. I'd look at the business section, Wall Street Journal, front section, and then you know, kind of look at what's going on there in the other sections. New York Times front section, and, and I'd look at the, the you know the national news and then the editorial pages. I kind of got a, a system down where I would whip through it in about 45 minutes. USA Today, when the economic stuff started, I made a point of looking at least at the front page of the Financial Times. Uh, Washington Times, I would always look at the front page and the editorial page. Uh, now, meanwhile, the political playbook would would pop in at some point in there, and that to me was 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 really the, almost a must read of the morning mm -hmm. you know and Mike Allen you know if you don't subscribe you should go on to politico.com and subscribe it comes every morning in your into your uh, email and you'll be smarter when you get finished reading it and it's funny he has birthdays and little anecdotes and you know funny excerpts from the White House pool reports and all kinds of stuff in there and and um, but he always covers the, sort of the news of the day uh -huh. and then and then and then I would and then uh, like Slate.com, I subscribed to a summary of front pages that they did, um, um, and then and then as the day went on, I would do a few, a few blogs that I would check, including the, you know, the uh, Politico stuff on the Politico and on the on the news sites like um, the newspapers, but also, you know, I'd go to Drudge and, and other other places. I'd look at the uh, like Real Clear Politics is a good site for for conservative columnists and uh, and uh, opinion pieces for the day. 
So it was just sort of a matter of getting a little bit of a system and a rhythm down. But it was a lot. I mean, and you can't, you know, you can't know everything, you know. And if there was a day when healthcare was of a particular importance or whatever, I would make sure that I, you know, read everything on that in a little bit more detail, for example. What do you read? Do you read uh, in the same way now? You know, it's funny. I, uh, the first couple of weeks, I did not read in, in the same way. I'd read the Post in USA Today and I'd look at the Times online. But I, did it, I didn't have the sense of urgency or I didn't feel like I had the need to like, know all this stuff. And then, and then um, as I started working you know, and, and uh, being involved with clients and their issues, and then I started you know, getting asked to do some television stuff, about the stimulus, and I was like, you know, I have not paid close enough attention. So I sort of found myself, you know, re-immersing, and, and, and so now I, I make sure that I, that I read, uh, uh, you know, I'm looking more, the, the best thing about it is I read the same kind of stuff, but I don't have to read the whole story. You know, it's like I'll read the first couple of paragraphs, and I'll look down for quotes, you know, and I don't feel like I have to be an expert on this. I just have to kind of get the feel for what's going on. Then if I'm asked to do an interview, on the housing thing, for example, like I did Sunday with Chris Wallace in the afternoon on Fox, I knew as of um, I knew as of Thursday or Wednesday, whatever it was, that I was going to do this interview. So as the week went on, I just kept bookmarking online different stories about the housing stuff for myself, and then I went back to it on uh -huh. Saturday and Sunday morning and kind of made sure I was up to speed. But um, uh, you know, it just you kind of get into a groove where you kind of manage it. But uh, now I'm doing more of it online. You know, uh, uh -huh. you know. So, did you all find that um, that a very big issue for you is that there is a huge amount of information? It is how do you bring understanding to all the information that's out there? You know, the, one of the things the president is working on his book right now, and he, one of the things he's going to address in his book is he, the framework will be. I don't know if it'll be ten decisions, but it's going to be about decision making, and. You know, he he, he 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 wants to add the context, and context is what often gets lost in the nonstop news cycle. You know, where there is not time uh, to reflect and think about when the president made the decision, you know, to do whatever. What what factors? What was happening that day that that led to that decision? What you remember the next day is just that he decided, uh -huh. you know, on this thing, and so. Um, I think the hardest thing to do, in the, as fast-paced as things are now, is to go back and add the insight, and the, you know, and you can do it with columnists, I think, you know, but you still have to get on it quickly. Now, remember, you know, I, I know when I worked for the Mavericks, for example, this is the thing I used to always do when, you know, we would always be blamed like for some bad draft pick or some bad trade or whatever, and I used to say, now remember, it, it's easy to say, in in 19, you know, 86 that Bill Garnett was a bad draft pick in 1982. But you forget that, you know, who were the other choices and what did we already have on the roster. You forget the context that was made, at why you made that pick. And now, 25 years later, it's light speed faster and, and even more difficult to remind people. Uh -huh. uh, you know, so I think that's the, the thing you can try to deal with. Let's have one question from, uh, from each place. Uh, Towson? Um, what was President Bush's biggest strength as a communicator and his biggest weakness? Uh, good question. I think, I think his biggest strength was a couple things, I would say. First of all, he always had a communications person in the room. You know, I mean, he, he took input from us. Uh, and I mean at the beginning of a process or before an interview or whatever it might be. Um, not, that he, not, that, not from a standpoint of being scripted, but from the standpoint of, um, uh, you know, pointing out, kind of a reminder there's so much going on at a given time it's good right before you do an interview or whatever to have a reminder remember this is what's important to this guy he's going to ask you about energy or whatever it might be so everything there was a reason for doing every interview you know there was no you know just let's talk to the wall street journal because it was all tied to strategy he really believed in that process of communications planning and and strategy and 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 uh and, and so that was so that that was good i think he also was very genuine you know, his, the reputation that he has for the, you know, the malapropisms and some of the, you know, mistakes, a lot of that comes from his, um, uh, you know, he likes to put people at ease, and, in, and especially in smaller group situations, he would often poke fun at himself, and, and, and but, you know, he, he was a very genuine guy who was not real scripted or not, not, um, 
and I, and I think that, I think that he, what you saw was you know the sincerity, you know, came through. You know, weakness. You know, I think um, I, you know I said this the other day to somebody. He he does not have a great facility for names. You know, and he would get tangled up sometimes with names or mispronounced names, and some of them were funny, and he would make fun of himself about it. You know, that sometimes gave you know people the the uh, you know they would you know make fun of him or whatever. Um, uh, I think he was a guy you know um, who um, uh, chemistry is important in interpersonal relationships with him. And I think sometimes that was to his detriment in interviews. If if it was a reporter, not somebody that always you know, wrote favorable things or that he personally liked. But if it was a reporter that he had a, a good chemistry with or respected them and they had had a, a good, good exchanges in the past, the interviews almost always went better. And I'll give you an example of that. I think one of the best interviews that was done down the home stretch was with Steve Scully's uh, in the Oval Office. It was one of the last interviews. Yeah. And he, Steve was a guy, the president knew him for a long time, um, and and he, he asked tough questions, but he asked them in a way that, and you know, the president obviously is not a real introspective guy, you know, and so here he was at the end of his presidency, and he was being, you know, retrospective anyway, and, and Steve asked the questions that put him in a frame of mind, he, he was in a frame of mind anyway at the end to look back a little bit more than usual, but Steve just teed up the questions in a way that uh, he, the answers were really, really interesting, and I think he couldn't, the president was not good at doing that if he didn't have a good connection with the interviewer. And that may be, he didn't fake it very well. He's a very, you know, and I'll give you one real, I'll give this quickly because I know I want, we want to get to a couple more questions. When we brought in the American Idol uh, finalists in 2006 to meet with the president in the Oval Office, he didn't want to do it at first because he doesn't watch the show. And he thought it was disingenuous or inauthentic, kind of fake, for him to be, you know, yucking it up with these, these young people because he was not, he didn't know about the show, and so he thought it was going to look like he was just, you know, it was an artificial deal. He would not do anything that was, that was fake. So if he didn't have a great, you know, two-way, you know, connection with somebody, I think the interviews were not as, as good. And I think there are some politicians who can, who, who can set that aside and be, you know, you know be, uh, you know, artificial in the way they feel about the person or whatever. And, and uh, he did a good job of not getting overly defensive, but I think the interviews went better with guys that he had a connection with, and that might be, to your, your question, that might be viewed as a little bit of a weakness. Yeah. Do you have one? Um, with, a, with a staff under the president as large as it is, how do you keep everybody on message? How, I mean, how do you make sure that on I'll a daily basis? It's a great question. We, we, had, we were a disciplined place. You know, there were, there were, we, didn't, we were not a White House that leaked. We were not a White House that had separate camps. Um, and there was a discipline that, that flowed through the place. But the way people stayed on message was at 7.30 in the morning, the very first thing in the very first meeting of the day was the press secretary talking about the news of the day, what help she needed to, to, to navigate, what policy information she needed, how are we going to deal with, with the fact that in Detroit yesterday the automakers said this and this and this. And then we'd go from there to the 8 o'clock communications meeting in Ed Gillespie's office, and we would review all this, and we'd kind of make our battle plan for the day. And everybody in the administration knew to, that, you know, we had talking points available, we did Q&A documents, there was this discipline and this process was in place. So if the Secretary of Transportation had an event on a given day, and something had happened in Detroit, their people knew that they could call the White House and say, what are we saying about, you know, this thing that just happened with, you know, the United Auto Workers and GM? And we could we could give them the answer, and and that was uh, if there's a real there, there there's a discipline that's required to do it. But once you get in the in the in the groove, it becomes second nature, and, and it's it's an important thing to do. Okay, we'll take one more, one more from Towson. Um, just since you're basically an expert in taking a complex message and really simplifying it. Um, what, is there any particular issue that no matter how hard you know you try, that the press just wouldn't even buy into it, or the general public? Just it's wouldn't a it's a great question, a and I'll tell you I'll tell you the uh, the summer of '08, I guess it was the S chip was that '08 or '07, Martha? I think it was '08. Was last summer? Yeah, it was last. Summer. Or it might have been '07. It was '07, <laughs> I think. But the state children's health insurance sure. program S chip, and and. Uh, there were reasons why Republicans in general, including the president, were against S-CHIP. And to explain 
what we did for children's health and why we didn't like the bill that was coursing its way through Congress took, like, we, you know, we used to say, like Democrats would say, they hate children. They don't want children to have, they don't want poor children to have health insurance. And we used to joke around that they have a bumper sticker and we have like a two-page fact sheet. You know, and, and, and the S-chip thing, we never, we never really were able to explain why, we, why our plan was better. It's so much easier to say poor children should have health insurance than it is to explain our position, you know. And so that's one that was really complicated, and, and we never really cracked the code on how best to do it, despite our efforts, you know, uh, to do it. Thank you very much, Sally. We appreciate it very much. Very, You're very welcome. I enjoyed session. it. This was... This was, I think, my third time, and the first time uh, since leaving the White House, and yeah. so I enjoyed well, thank it. You very thank you. Those were really, really good questions, and I really appreciate it. Thank you very you much. You bet.